My name is Thea Lugogongela. I work at uh, oh, uh, AU. I have uh, Milena Koredik and Jens Pilsen as my supervisors. And together with them, I have been working on yeah, dephosphorylating the casein micelle, basically, which is going to be the topic of today. And the objective of the work uh, was to investigate. One second. Here we go. Uh, the objective of the work was to investigate the structural effects due to uh, the dephosphorylation of the casein cell, And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. However, the objective of the talk today uh, is to uh, see whether SACs can actually be employed to study subtle structural, cha structural changes in the cell as a consequence of dephosphorylation. So to those of you who don't know the casein micelle, it's a proteinaceous colloidal structure in milk, and it's composed of casein proteins, kappa, beta, alpha S1, and alpha S2. Uh, kappa casein is on the outside, is shown in green in the figure, and it is uh, sterically stabilizing the uh, casein micelle, preventing it from growing it growing indefinitely, and to sort of uh, aggregating with adjacent micelles. Um, it's held together by different interactions. Um, electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions. And the electrostatic ones are due to, or in part due to, the phosphorylations of the caseins. And they bind calcium, forming so called calcium phosphate uh, nanoclusters. And the hydrophobic interactions happen because the caseins are rather hydrophobic molecules. So they stick together by, yeah, by hydrophobically interacting. And especially part of the beta casein which is in the figure shown in blue, is uh, thought to be anchored only through hydrophobic bonds um, and stabilizing presumed water channels within the casein micelle. Because the casein micelle is a rather hydrated structure. And since the caseins are rather hydrophobic, there has to be some way to sort of like stabilize and include all of this water. And here comes in the beta casein, presumably, uh, stabilizing these so-called uh, water channels. Um, so the idea uh, behind this dephosphorylation work was actually to try to see if we can answer some of these questions, uh, such as, well, can we even have dephosphorylation in a micellar system? Um, I mean, do, does the, uh, the phosphatase, does it actually enter the micelle and start uh, working inside of it? And if so, are we actually uh, able to alter the chemistry of the, um, of the casings and thus the, also the internal structure? Um, and if so, what does this actually tell us on the original casing micelle structure? And I, I'm just gonna disclaim it right now. I'm, I don't have the answers to these questions yet. So uh, don't expect that from, from this talk. Um, However, we have chosen small angle X-ray study is scattering to study the micellar structure because it has previously been shown, proven actually to, to be a quite useful tool to study the, the total structure of the micelle. Uh, what is shown here is uh, the graph is a, a typical scattering profile of a casein micelle. And we have these three main scattering features, the low Q scattering, um, plateau, which is many people, most people actually agree that is due to the overall scattering of the micelle. Um, then we have the intermediate region uh, where there's like a, a small bump or shoulder. And then we have the more pronounced uh, high Q shoulder here. And uh, the bars represent the Q ranges over which previous um, investigators have, have recorded the scattering of the casein micelle. Now, in order to actually understand and interpret the scattering data, we have to have models, mathematical models that can describe uh, what the features mean. I mean, what kind of physical structures are we actually seeing? Do we have in this solution uh, or suspension? And uh, many people have done it. I mean, there's a, a model by Bouchou, by Ingham, which is actually based on a previous model by uh, Jens Kopilsen. Um, however, the structure of the dephosphorylated casein micelle has not been uh, looked at before by small angle X-ray scattering. Mainly, dephosphorylation has been studied in monomeric systems, so where the caseins are soluble and, and free-floating. Um, so, what did I do? I um, I basically created 
this series of samples consisting of resuspended casein micelles in native and increasingly demineralized environments, thereby causing a gradual casein dissociation. So I have skim milk, ultracentrifuge dips separating the serum phase from the micellar phase, uh, discarding the supernatants, and the micelles, the pellets, uh, where we suspended in various permeate uh, media. So creating four samples, MCN100, MCN50, MCN0, and MCN50 DTA. So MCN100, uh, in here, the pellet was resuspended in 100% permeate. So basically the native environment of the micelles minus the whey proteins. Um, so this re represents more or less the, the most native-like micelle. Then we had the MCN50, which is resuspended in 50% water and 50% um, permeate. MCN0, 100% water. And MCN50 DTA was resuspended in 50% permeate and 50% 18 millimolar uh, EDTA solution. So we have this series of samples, series of suspensions here, um, in which we have a decreasing ionic strength. Then they were either treated with phosphatase. I have abbreviated it uh, calf intestinal alkaline phosphatase. Yeah, CAP. Uh, and then, uh, or untreated. Then the suspensions were, uh, were, were analyzed chemically or compositionally by reverse phase uh, HPLC and structurally by small angle X-ray scattering. Um, to understand the system more in depth, we also separated the suspensions soluble phases by, by ultracentrifuging them a second time, obtaining uh, supernat the supernatants, which um, represents whatever we have uh, soluble. And they were also analyzed in the same way. So first, let's take a look at the, um, at the supernatants slash the backgrounds. Um, and this is the reverse phase chromatograms. Um, the upper one is the protein composition of the uh, micellar suspension. And we can see we have uh, all of the caseins. We have uh, three kappa casein peaks, alpha S2, alpha S1, beta, and some trace amounts of whey proteins. And um, then just due to the resuspension in these various media uh, with various mineral concentrations, we obtain different degrees of casein dissociation. So we can see that in the more native like my cell, which is the MCN100, we don't have much casein dissociation. We have a little bit, it's the blue curve down here. Then um, replacing half of the soluble minerals with water, we obtain a little bit more casein dissociation and even a little bit more when we're suspended in just, in just water. And then when we treat the micelles with EDTA, we, just, we actually pull out quite a lot of casein. Um, so we looked at what structures we could observe with small angle X-ray scattering in the soluble phase. And that's what we're gonna look at here. And, and what we see is that with increasing amounts of casein soluble in the soluble phase, um, we, they, they make different structures. They have different structure, uh, scattering patterns or scattering profiles meaning that they actually form some kind of structures out there. And this actually highlights why it's so crucial to use the right kind of sample for background subtractions when looking at the structures that you actually want to, to see. Um, so we use these samples for um, background subtraction when looking at our actual micelles. Yeah, these are just the take home messages from this slide, go on. Um, and this is, this is the sacs of the actual untreated micelles. So um, the main difference uh, that we can observe is happening here in the intermediate region, at least among the MCN 100, 50, and 0, and also in the intensity of the high Q shoulder. The intensity of the EDTA treated micelle is lower for all Q values. And I think that's because we saw that more casein dissociates uh, due to the EDTA treatment. And that casein uh, contributes to the scattering of the, of the background. Um, um, and I mean, I'm not gonna go too much into detail. So what, what this structurally means, 
the fact is just, I mean, my point is just that we can actually observe changes, even with, when we have treated the micelles very mildly, uh, we can observe small changes in the intermediate region and in the high Q shoulder. So what happens then when we start dephosphorylating the micelles? Um, figure A you saw before. Figure C is um, the, suspend, the cap-treated suspensions. And we can see that we're actually able to separate the phosphorylated species from the dephosphorylated species marked in red. Um, and what I noticed from this is that the yellow curve, which is the MCN50 DTA, that is uh, prone to way more dephosphorylation. I mean, it contains more dephosphorylated species than the other, uh, than the other samples and the other micelles. And, and I mean, I guess it makes sense, right? Because we dissociated more caseins uh, when treating it with EDTA. And I assume that the free flowing caseins are more susceptible to cap attack, to phosphatase attack compared to the, to the micellar ones. Um, so it seems that, that the micelle does seem to have a, like a, a limiting, the structure itself seems to have a limiting factor. Um, then when we look at the soluble phases, the supernatants, um, well, we see that what was before soluble here in the untreated micelles, so this casing must be present already when, when we add the phosphatase, that's no longer present. Um, so, so, some, so the phosphatase must have, must have acted on whatever casein was out there. Um, what then has happened to this dephosphorylated casein? I don't know. Um, could they have made particles on their colloidal particles on their own that then are sedimentable, or do they just merely precipitate, or are they do they attach to the casein micelle surface of some, uh, in some way? I don't know. However, they're gone. Um, and then in the EDTA treated sample, in the EDTA, EDTA treated uh, soluble phase we can see that it's mainly the dephosphorylated species that are present in the soluble phase. So the mineral environment must have some kind of effect on how these dephosphorylated species act or behave. Then we looked at um, the sacs of these captured micelles and this is what we see. Um, again, the main difference uh, in scattering that we observe is in these uh, in the intermediate region here and in the uh, in the high q shoulder and in the in the EDTA sample it behaves uh, differently which is as i probably due to to the EDTA treatment itself which is another kind of treatment that we're introducing so um so so even here also with with the phosphatase treatment we're actually able to, um, to detect changes. Um, yeah, as I said before, I mean, to, to actually interpret on, on what kind of structural changes we're observing, physically speaking, we need a model. And we are working on such a model, or Jens Skov Pilsen uh, has been working on such a model. And he has actually been able to refine uh, a casein micelle model uh, by combining the scattering of the casein micelle over a much wider Q range. So we have combined the scattering uh, from static light scattering, representing the first bar here, um, with the, the SACS scattering of small, ang small angle X-ray scattering in a low Q conformation with the scattering from a high Q conformation. And all of this put together, uh, with all of this put together, he has been able to refine the model and to actually um, better quantize, quantify um, what are the internal changes that are happening. Um, and yeah, I look very much forward to actually start applying this model to my data uh, so we can start verifying what kind of changes uh, we're seeing. So conclusively, well, changing the chemical environment of the micelles clearly results in some 
kind in some degree of casein dissociation. And, and these particles form, may form some, some kind of structures that may also be observed by small angle X-ray scattering. And um, well, my data suggests that, that SACs can be used to study these subtle changes uh, occurring to the structure of the casein in the cell. And that was it for me. Questions? Thank you, Tia. Yes. Um, Tommy asked, how did you control the pH of the system to, to compare water with the milk salt solution? Can you say that again and slowly? Yeah. How did you control the pH of the system to compare uh, your water with the milk salt solution? Hmm. Actually, I didn't. I didn't exactly control it. I, um, I made sure that whatever I added was at the right pH. So I guess I controlled it. I controlled it beforehand. Does that make sense? Uh, we'll have to ask Tommy if it made sense to him. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, my point is that this, this uh, milk salts are extremely complex uh, mixture of uh, citrate and calcium, uh, everything under the sun. I'm then to say it. And, and then if you change, if you dilute it, you change everything and you can affect the pH and the, the association of the whole system. Uh, this said, I think it's a very nice study. It's a very can, I, can I help Thea? Yeah. <laughs> um, when you, first of all, these, uh, these systems are not extremely diluted. They are basically the same kind of protein concentrations in milk. And, uh, and so the buffering capacity of the protein is high enough to keep the pH constant. And also the dilutions that we make are very similar to the dilutions that are made during uh, concentration of milk by filtration, uh, which is uh, known as not affecting the structure, or at least people think they're not affecting yeah, the structure, but obviously the fact, the fact that Thea has managed to, uh, to really subtract yeah. the right backgrounds from the scattering tells you that it's actually changing the structure. Yeah. yeah so, you know, it's... it's uh, yeah, that's my point, actually. Yeah. I agree completely. Okay, Alessandro has a question here. Um, I assume the low Q shoulder corresponds to the uh, radius of gyration of the whole casein micelle. What about the high Q shoulder? It is very small. Is it a sub micelle? Um, so, according to the model that Jens Scholl has been working on, it's due to the scattering of the calcium phosphate nanoclusters and surrounded by a protein um, protein shell. Um, I don't know how much does it say here, Milena, but I guess, I mean, it, he has found out that it's like this ellipsoidal-like uh, structure, yeah, internally with the calcium phosphate nanoclusters, the more electron dense and then surrounded by a fairly more electron dense layer of protein compared to whatever is outside of that. Yeah, well, Thea has been managing to collect data at high Qs and low Qs, like at a much larger range. So, so Janskov has been managing to put more uh, absolute values to the core shell structure of the uh, of the calcium phosphate nanocluster mm -hmm. in the bottom uh, range. And so he he's he's supposed to uh, be able to now measure uh, the the thickness of the layer of the protein around the calcium phosphate nanoclast. Yeah. That's, that's his model. That's why he's, he's managed now with, uh, with her data because of the background subtraction to really come up to, uh, to absolute values for the value for the model. Okay. Just quick, quick, where do you, how, how do you achieve such low noise in the high Q range? We like, have a good instrument. The, yeah. Where is this thing? Sorry, I didn't catch it. We have a good instrument. It's in all of its Jens. Yes, yeah, it's the best. But that's not unbelievable, no low noise in the high Q region. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure, it would be, uh, be uh, interesting to discuss the details of the model and of course see some fits from uh, when Yen gets around or you-, you, you... Yeah, you're gonna have to talk to him, Jakob. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, 
Uh, just one thing, I'm sure he would know this, but I just want to, uh, I'm sure you know this paper that uh, Greg Smith and uh, Liliane, who are both here, they did on the sticky spheres model and so on, so which uh, is probably relevant for the static light scattering part also. So let's just see, look at the time. What, one quick question. Um, so the, 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 the pattern where you showed the lower intensity of the EDTA sample, that, this is not just a contrast thing? uh that the edga lowers the difference in electron density between the solvent and the proteins um, well how could it if i subtract the right background that 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 that, that, that will still uh, the, the the intensity absolute intensity of your particles are relying on the contrast between solvent and uh, and and the particle itself and that, that is not <laughs> I mean, yeah, but Jakob, remember that she's got a lot of stuff in solution now, eh? Yeah, yeah. I'm just so, asking. The, the so EDG the subtraction, the her background, her background subtraction uh, decreases the value, and it has a lot of scattering from the background that has to be subtracted. Sure, I understand that, of course. Uh, still, the absolute intensity. I've that before. The contrast. So if the contrast has changed, the absolute intensity will change. So there you you can yeah. check with check with Jan. I will. Anyway, that's perfect timing. Thank you, Tia.